All right, let's do this. Three, two, one. <laughs> you know, so All right, welcome to the podcast. So we're here to introduce <laughs> ourselves. My name is Javier Maudet. I am the director of sales of Aviation Concepts. It's a company located in Sunrise, Florida. What we do is we um, sell aircraft parts. We buy big planes, uh, A320, A330, A340s. 747s, all these kind of big planes. And uh, oh, hey, I don't want to say big planes because you have a lot of people that really know about planes, right? So we're catering. This is how, when I usually talk to people that don't know anything about aviation or what I do, I say big planes because then like, immediately they're like, oh, my friend has a Cessna. And I'm like, no, we deal with the, you know, the commercial aircrafts. So yes, um, commercial aircraft, that's what we do. And we buy the planes. Sometimes we uh, tear them down at different uh, places around the world. Um, I myself have uh, been to um, Victorville, California once when we had a 747 landed there and we did the tear down there. And then we take the parts out and send them to repair station, FAA approved shops and have them recertify the parts. And then we sell them back to the airlines. So that's in a nutshell, sort of what we do. Hello. That's awesome. And so how long have you been doing this? I started in... Uh, in 99, I was uh, in Los Angeles and a company called Bill Thomas and Associates that for your airline aficionados that are watching us today, if you ever go down and walk through a warehouse and you see these very colorful containers um, that go on the break, on the brakes, those may, these are, were made by this company. They are made by this company. Or if you see on the wheels of the aircraft, uh, a colorful uh, plastic cover, that's also made by this company. Or any of the ATA containers for the very expensive parts like computers and stuff like that, that get shipped sometimes on the belly of an aircraft. If, um, if an uh, airline doesn't have these materials where they're flying to, then they put these uh, parts that are very expensive parts that need to be protected. And the, this company made these containers. So I started in 99 with them. Um, not having any idea of aviation at all, only knowing that there was a map in this guy's office that I went to see that had a lot of little dots everywhere. And as I'm talking to them and I'm interviewing, I'm like, what's up with the map? And they're like, well, if you take this job, potentially you could travel all over the world to see these customers. And in my mind, I was like, I'll take it. So that's how I started. And then um, a year and a half later, I got it. Uh, I always wanted to move to Miami uh, because, you know, why not? It's amazing. And I got a job offer. I came on a business trip, actually. And after spending a week here, I had like four or five job offers. Everybody that would go try to sell them these containers, they'd be like, oh, that's great. But we're looking for someone like you. Do you want to come work with us? So it was pretty cool to, you know, go visit all these companies and, and get all of these job offers. And I did take one of them, which is the current one that I have. Um, I was with them for three years, two years. 9-11 happened six months after I arrived. So as you all know, it was a huge hit for our industry. Um, obviously, the people who are listening, you have a lot of pilots and they know how it was. From our side was the other side, the commercial side of selling uh, aircraft parts. And it was just like a complete drop. And it was no movement at all. But uh, within three weeks, uh, me and my boss, who's the owner of the company, um, we were back on the road visiting customers, which is a huge difference on what's happening now with the COVID situation. Back in 2001 with 9-11, um, it was a small time of period that it was uh, a downside. You know, we were like down for uh, two weeks, but right away, planes were flying back in the end and it took off. It was a huge hit for an industry. Um, you can argue that there was a bubble that it just had to happen or many other potential economical aspects of it. But um, the difference now is that we haven't been able to get back in the skies to visit our customers. And we have seen that uh, in our business, only our customer base is uh, mostly all the commercial aircrafts um, uh, for passengers, but we also do cargo. And the cargo operators has really been what kept us going these last, uh, this last year. Uh, FedEx and UPS being our, one of our biggest customers. 
um, they they kept flying and, and if not more. So um, in that sense, that's what kind of helped us around. But we're hoping that with uh, the vaccine coming out and everything, things will be back to normal. We have already seen uh, uh, more requests for parts from our customers, United, one of them, uh, American Airlines, uh, Delta. So we see that there is a, an, a trend of going up and we hope that with, by the summer, uh, we'll, we should be seeing uh, um, much more improvements. Wow, thank you. And, I know, that was a, um, a quite the question, and then you got a huge answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's awesome. Um, you answered a lot of questions that many of our viewers want to ask, um, particular, in particular, the, the trend, um, the uphill trend for the use of aircrafts, which is what a lot of people um, are inquiring about. You know, everyone wants to know when is the travel industry, you know, going to pick up again. And from your answer, it seems like it has been picking up, but more on the car cargo side, you said, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, no, the cargo had always kept steady, if not more. Steady. Um, and actually, a couple of our customers, uh, Virgin Atlantic is one of our customers in, uh, in England, and they actually converted the, the aircraft into a cargo uh, plane. So we had a lot of customers that were no longer doing routes as a passenger run, but using these brand new 787s, um, putting some tarp over the seats so they will not damage them and utilizing um, all, you know, all that space to put boxes and, and, and use it as a cargo. Um, that was a, a source of revenue for them. Um, so it was uh, quite interesting to hear our colleagues in the industry to discuss all the things that they had to do to continue flying and trying to, you know, because just like a, like a car payment, just because you're not, you're not traveling, you're not using the car. It doesn't mean you don't have to pay the lease. And then the same thing happens on the aircrafts. So they have all these uh, uh, costs associated with them. So uh, it was, I had a, I remember I, I'm mentioning version because I, I had a conversation. They had a part that they needed. We had it in stock and we were able to help them. And I was like, well, you guys flying back again? It's like, no, dude, this was a cargo operation only. So yeah, now hopefully we'll we'll see this uh, through. And like I said, uh, by the summer, I'm thinking that we'll have a lot more people flying, and that will that will have us be more busy. But um, one thing that uh, is true, the airline operators uh, would fly. I don't know, uh, for one route they would have it five six times a day. Now they only have two times a day. So although you'll see more. Uh, movement is a much more reduced amount of flights um, sure. and and they're using their newer aircraft which uh, um, this was an opportunity for them to move away from their older aircraft to the newer aircraft and so you particularly you guys particularly uh, are focused on I guess generating income based on replacing parts so do you use um, are you there more for the supply of older Aircrafts. Correct. Or... Yes. So the the newer generation, uh, uh, well, the NG on seven five seven three seven is already getting older, uh, but we're talking when forever when we see a request from a company uh, for a seven eight seven or a three fifty, it's very difficult to find unless you had the foresight of, of uh, purchasing these air these bits because you knew there was going to be a lot of replacement from the OEM uh, two years three years ago. Um, it's very difficult to supply them with those parts. So uh, what we focus on mostly is this 777 uh, material, A320, uh, which are, there are already been many teardowns. Um, so there's a lot of parts available for that. And, so, and then do you guys only focus, um, is your company in particular um, domestic to the, in, to the United States market or North America market? No, actually market? worldwide. We, I, today I, I got an RFQ this morning from Qantas. So um, Singapore, uh, Qatar Airways, uh, um, all over Europe, uh, Latin America as well. TAM is one of our customers, uh, Lan Chile as well, uh, LATAM now. Uh, but yeah, no, we're, we're worldwide. We have customers all over. And a lot of times I don't have all the parts, so we have to go into the market and try to broker them to see if there's a part. I was going to ask you, can you pretty much explain like from the beginning to like what that process is like for you 
um, how it begins. Right. So aviation concepts, yeah, aviation concepts, we have, uh, I would say, about four pillars that we focus on. Um, one of them is what I described earlier, which is buying the aircraft, tearing it down, sending those parts for repairs, and then having them ready. So when a customer needs and we have them available for them via outright sell exchange. Do you know what an exchange is? You ever heard of that term? Exchange? Depends, no. So exchange yeah. is a, a yeah. Um, when the air when they need a part um, and they already have a part, but it's not fixed. It, it's, it's on the aircraft, and what they need is they 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 don't want to buy a new part, but they want to uh, get a new, uh, a part that is already tagged. That was ready to go with an AFA 8130 that's been to a shop that's good to go. And they get it from us. Uh, they remove the bit from the aircraft and they change, they, they put our bit in. And then they give us that as removed a bit and then send it back to us. We send it to the repair shop or they send it directly to the repair shop. And we repair it. We keep that part and we charge them for whatever that repair was. So that's part of an exchange program that we have. Um, a lease program also is part of it. Uh, sometimes an airline, it's, um, for example, United Airlines goes to Japan. Um, we have a part available in Japan. They borrow it from us. And then they, when they come back to Chicago, they take it out of the aircraft and then they, um, they give us our power back, our part back. So that's also a part of what we do is uh, leases. We have long-term leases as well. We'll buy a part from uh, the OEM um, and we'll lease it back to the airline. And then among all these other things, if uh, there's an AOG aircraft on ground, which I'm, you're familiar with, um, yes. we go to the market and see who has it available. And sometimes I have a part in repair, but it's not ready. So I will take an exchange from that company, send that part from, to the airline that's ready to go. And then I will deal with the other company. So several different things. We called it like a tailor, uh, you know, when you go to the tailor and you tell them I want uh, a black suit with pink stripes or whatever, then, you know, it's all tailor made. Awesome. And so let's kind of like take you away from your professional side and um, kind of pull you into how being exposed internationally or, or to the whole aviation industry has pulled you from that to do something that you love. Um, yeah, so what um, that's um, a, a hobby of mine that I have. Uh, it's called Amigos Near Foundation. Um, we started uh, 11 years ago here in Miami. A friend of mine asked me, hey, um, you know a lot of people. Can you help me collect toys for kids with cancer at Miami Children's Hospital? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So I sent an email out and saying, hey, I'm doing this. You guys want to help me? And like I said, I've been doing this for 20 years in the industry, in the aviation industry. So I emailed my friends that I work with. Uh, some of them are customers and some of them are my, uh, I'm their customer. So uh, people that I deal with and I said, hey, can you help me? And I raised $700 uh, the first time I did it. And then with that money, we went to, to uh, the shops, we purchased the toys. And then we had a party where we wrap all the toys. And all this I was capturing on video. And then we deliver the toys to the kids with cancer at Miami Children's Hospital. And that was obviously, and I don't know if you've ever been involved with something like that, but it's, it's truly an emotional uh, experience. Uh, not only uh, helping the kids, but watching them open them presents and playing with them. And that, that's, uh, that, that was really what did it for me. I was like, I need to do this from now on. So having the opportunity to make a YouTube video of all of that, I send it again to everybody that helped donate it and say, hey, thank you. This is what you helped create, which is always good to include people into whatever you do. Um, and then from there, it just evolved. And to make it very short, in 11 years, um, we have been featured on uh, CNN and Espanol. Uh, we've been in several magazines. Um, we visited 65 countries and we have helped thousands of kids. And it all depends on what... We do. Sometimes we go to school and we help the, the kids in the school. Sometimes we go to a hospital. Um, sometimes we go to an orphanage and we get them new mattresses or it's what I always say. We help how we can, when we can. Um, and it's, uh, it's called Amigos Near, which uh, um, an orphan sometimes is the most important thing to know that they're not alone in the world. And Amigos means a friend in Spanish, a near, you know, near. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what we do. It's a hobby of mine. 
and we we just want to continue to help and we i was just in tulum for vacation uh um uh, and i brought some toys to kids with can uh, at a local place that it's like a small village um we went to the supermarket i got some food i got some of the people that were with me involved to help and that was great i mean that's how people once they do it they love it so yeah and how long have you have you had this foundation 11 years we started in 2009 um so now it's 11 years and and how many countries have you been to 65 countries so we uh, and obviously not me myself not only uh, not myself only but um um, several people have uh, that follow us on Instagram or they're friends of mine or they heard about us. Um, they, we will work with them and say, okay, where are you going? And if we, we used to have a lot of toys because every time we do a toy drive now through, because of COVID, we kind of run dry on that. Uh, we don't have as many toys as we used to have. Uh, but, um, you know, if you, for example, a friend of mine went to South Africa and we helped them raise money. Um, they raised, uh, I think like $3,000 and a hundred percent of what they raised, we gave them to them. So we didn't keep anything, but they use our platform, our website, our PayPal, all that thing to collect the money. Um, we're 501 C. So we're like legit foundation. We're, uh, you know, we're, I don't know, 501 C is like legit something. Um, and we were able to help kids in South Africa. Uh, my friends went, they traveled there. Everybody pays their own uh, flights, obviously. Um, we are a nonprofit, 100% uh, volunteer foundation with zero overhead, meaning there's no salaries. They're just, just people wanted to help when we can. And how do you, how do you plan that? Is it, is it, well, there's no is planning, it actually planned really. or there's, is it just, there, there, okay. it's just, you kind of wing it. And um, I was in, in Africa once, I went to Tanzania. And I was having, I brought up a duffel bag full of toys without knowing to whom I was going to give it to. And we're having dinner at a restaurant and then table next door, they're laughing, having a good time. Um, we started chatting and they happened to be doctors at a local uh, hospital, exchange student doctors from Europe, uh, helping this hospital in Tanzania. So I'm like, hey, I have a bunch of toys. Can I come over tomorrow? She's like, yeah, come over. So I just came the next day. Sometimes it just takes that, you know, no, not really planning. Another opportunity was in the Philippines uh, on the beach. And this uh, guy who had two children uh, was selling stuff. Uh, and I got talking to them and realized uh, he told me that they just moved from another island with his family, his two children, his wife. Um, but they were in a little hut and didn't have, uh, they only had a mattress. That's all they had. And I'm like, well, let me help you. So I went to the supermarket with them. We bought, uh, two months worth of uh, food. Uh, we bought a, a, a drawer. Uh, the guys didn't have a, a stove to cook. So we bought them a stove, we bought them cooking pans and just made their life a little better. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you know the story of the, uh, of the starfish and the kid on the beach. Do you know this story? It's a pretty good That's story. It's not, it's not my story, but it's a pretty <laughs> good story. So there's this old guy and a little kid walking down the beach. And there's all these starfish and you know starfish when they get to shore um, they dry up and die um, and there was like thousands of starfish and the little girl is grabbing them and throwing them back and the old guy says you know there's so there's thousands of them you can't make a difference and the little girl looks at the old guy and says well for this one it makes all the difference and she threw that one back so the point is we can help everybody but sometimes the one person you can help you're going to make a difference so that's what we are about. And um, so you free, you guys frequent, what country do you frequent the most? So I, we go, obviously we're based in Miami. Most people are here in Miami. We have some people um, that are in California. So they've been to California, to Baja California a few times. Um, I, so what we do is mostly, uh, uh, you know, sometimes a couple thousand dollars to make a difference. Where in America, you really wouldn't be able to make that much of a difference. Uh, a couple of thousand dollars you could do, but you can buy the toys, you can buy the gifts. Uh, when we go to South America or other countries, uh, third world countries, that having someone buy them two months of food, it's going to make a huge difference. Uh, so that's, I was in Argentina, uh, I'm from Argentina, and we were able to buy 10 families food for two months. 
um, because we went uh, to a store, we bought a bunch of food, um, and we, with my brother, we went around and delivered them to this uh, very low-income families. Um, so Argentina is one of the places we go often, Colombia, uh, Mexico, I go to Mexico often. Um, but like I said, we've been to 65 countries because uh, it just happens when someone travels. Uh, I myself been to Tanzania, Africa. Um, I help uh, um, hospitals in Zurich. We, I, I, part of my aviation part is when I travel, I, I do this on, on my spare time. Um, so I, part of the other, my duties is put a conference together once a year in Europe uh, where we get all the European carriers to uh, have a meeting. And at the end of the meeting, I always request funds from the conference and that money we use to help children around the world, so. So that's how you've bridged that gap. That's awesome. And that's how, that's and then, how we get, we, we, our funds, our funding is 90% uh, um, from aviation uh, friends, people that, so Delta Airlines have, has donated, uh, American Airlines has donated, uh, the people that work in these companies, United, uh, friends of mine that, I, that are my customers, um, I will send an email saying, hey, I'm going down to Argentina. Does anybody want to help? And the good thing about Amigos Near is that uh, first they know me and they know that 100% of their donation is going to be used to do that. So if you say, well, I want to donate $50 and you try to give it to a big donation, a big foundation, you don't really know what that, you know, every, every, every little bit counts, but sure. you don't know what it's going to do. If you donate to Amigos Near, um, I will... You know, I will even show you the pair of shoes that you bought, for example, you know, I'll be like, these are love, these shoes you bought, and here's the kid that you gave them to. So it's a very That's personal awesome. connection that uh, the there text is. on that. That's, and so what are you guys at Amigos Near doing to pretty much um, navigate through this pandemic? So one thing that we did um, early on, um, it's... Uh, you know, if you have children, which I know you do, and you go to the supermarket with them and imagine the shock that it had to be at the beginning of the pandemic, um, going from uh, seeing everybody smile at times because you're a kid and everybody loves you and you're like, look, hi, yeah. and then suddenly everybody having a mask on. I mean, that had to be a very shocking thing. So the first thing I did, um, which we always did when we traveled to see uh, children, we would put red noses on. So we would put red noses and kids will always smile. So what we came up with was uh, making the mask with the red noses. So we, That's I started, awesome. I, I glue, I glue this myself and I just went to the supermarket and just walking around and just saying hi. And then the children's light, you know, their faces light up. Um, so we, uh, we partner with a, a friend of mine that makes these two for companies. And we, um, I, I got the mask for kids made by them. And I just had a happy hour here in my house and my friends came over and uh, while we drank, we glued all the guns. So depending on how much we drink, some, some are not perfectly aligned, but they're all pretty, uh, they're all pretty, uh, pretty good. It does uh, a job, right? Yeah, yeah. So That's we went awesome. to Argentina. How many, uh -huh. Yeah, we uh, did uh, 400 masks. Oh, for wow. Children. Wow. So we went to Argentina and, and I gave them to the kids in Argentina um, and, and the adults as well. And then uh, Mexico as well. Uh, locally here at the Miami Children's Hospital, we give them as well. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, just something to help the, uh, I mean, we always say we do it for their smiles. That's one of the motto, mottos that we have. Why do you, uh, you know, for example, when I went to Haiti, I went to a wedding and I was there and I, I, we found an orphanage and I go back to the, the party at the wedding. I'm like, hey, everybody give me $20 because if we give $20, $20, we can buy them mattresses. And the next day the wedding started and we were late because we were doing delivering the mattress. So one of the guys like, why do you do this? I mean, they're not your kids. And I'm like, I do it for their smiles. I do it because I was able to get them to smile. So that's, that's why we do it. We do it for their smiles. That's awesome. That's amazing. And so now, um, again, because of the pandemic, um, or I guess before that, you were you raised money, and a lot of the supplies you which you donate, you give, you you, you get from the actual countries, right? 
Correct. Uh, that's another great thing about us. Obviously, for two reasons: logistics. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a while back, we we had a deal with uh, with Haiti, uh, a company that would allow us to ship our things for free. So that was a huge success because my mm -hmm. when I was at that wedding in in Haiti, um, the 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 first thing I wanted to buy for them was a washing machine. They were they had thirty kids and they didn't have a washing machine. So the ladies that helped the orphanage were just doing everything by hand. And, and although the electricity was like on and off, you know, because Haiti, this is like 2012, right after the earthquake, um, right. I was like, I, I need to get you a washing machine. So after we got all the kids' mattresses, which was a, a, a great experience to bring the mattresses to the kids and have the lady who runs the orphanage saying, you don't realize because none of us do, but these children for the first time in their life they're going to sleep on their own bed That's so awesome. that was like a moment where you really you know you really grasp what you know you see something you, you want to do it but right. you, yeah. um so after that uh, when i came back i'm like oh i want to get you a washing machine so i went to walmart and i bought a washing machine and then i found a company to ship it but i remember the the, the washing machine was like 400 dollars, and the cost to ship it was 400 dollars Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, you know, because one of the things that uh, Amigos Near does is we don't want to send money. We want to buy the things ourselves or we go to the store when we're there and we'll buy the things. We don't want to give money to people uh, because that's just a, it just leads to there's no ending. Right. So right. that's why we always say we help when we can, how we can, uh, how because can. I can't awesome. take care of 30 kids. You know, you know, I, I can't. Um, it, it, there, there will be no end there will be no end of me trying to find right. money for them because education clothing food but what i can do is look at something like a picture in time and try to help it in that moment in time because we're not in, in the business of helping that's another thing that we do we're not in the business of helping that's why we're a hundred percent volunteer nonprofit with zero overhead if we were in the business of helping like other people are then somebody whose job will be like a full-time job to try to find money, right? That, that's how these foundations work, that sure. somebody, their job is to do that. Um, we're not that, so we are very limited in the funds we have. So whenever we help, it's like, again, I say a picture in time. What do you need? What can I help you with? This is how much I have. Okay, do you need new pots? We got new pots. You need mattresses? We got mattresses. But very limited because we're not a big foundation, so we don't have unlimited resources. And are you doing anything to expand um, where, where um, I guess, post-pandemic, when people are able to fly again, you are able to, um, I guess, just do more? Well, that's the thing about the platform that we created is it's, it's, it's a, there's no, so we can do nothing for a year and nothing's going to change. You know, like the only, our only costs that the, the people that are part of it help pay for it is, um, we have to do our taxes once a year. Uh, there's a, a website that needs maintenance, but it actually is donated. Uh, so it's very limited, the amount of money that we need. Um, so the real thing is whenever some opportunity comes to say, hey, let's do this. So for example, in Little Haiti, once a year, they would have a Christmas party. So we helped make the Christmas party better by hiring a band, uh, uh, the play music, uh, uh, paint, you know, uh, face paint, the, the donation. So it's all based on what, you know, something happens that said, hey, let's do this. But there's really no plan. The platform is set up so that whenever an opportunity that something comes, then we use it. Like when we went to Tulum um, or before, sorry, when I went to Argentina, um, I contacted a few friends and say, hey, I'm going to go to Argentina. You guys want to donate? And they know that if they donate $100 or $500, 100% goes to that. Um, and because we're 501c, a lot of my friends at the end of the year, they want to donate so they can uh, do better on their taxes because yeah. we, anybody that donates more than $250, we give them a tax deductible letter. Um, sure. 250 is the minimum that we use because as an individual, you can, you can say you donate up to 250 and you don't need a receipt or anything. So if you do more than 250, then we give you uh, a receipt. Um, so we went to Argentina and helped. So there's really no plan uh, because, again, this is a hobby and, you know, there's no strategy for making it bigger. 
we, 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 we don't want to make it bigger. We just want to make it so that whenever there's an opportunity of going somewhere, we can uh, email our friends and say, hey, you guys want to help? So whoever's listening, if they've been uh, in anywhere looking for someone to help, our, our foundation is available and you can help us with funding. And you'll see what we do on the website, amigosnear.org. All our pictures are there um, of what we do. Our financial statements, so that there is no, uh, no salaries. Um, when we started this, it was important for people to see that there was really, so we hire a CPA to do our books and sure. to, you know, one thing is for me to tell you there's no salaries. And another thing is for a CPA, which is, you know, they, they're putting their reputation on the line uh, to say so. So for the first few years we did it, but it was an expense that nobody checked. <laughs> it's like, I'm sure. doing this to, so now we don't hire the CPA anymore, but we still are, non, uh, we, we still don't have any salaries. But we just sure. decided to cut that cost because, you know, we were paying all this time someone to do this and, you know, no, nobody was really caring. So at the beginning, that, we did do it. but That's amazing. And the reason I wanted you to get into the nitty gritties of how the organization works um, and how easy it could be um, and not complicated, you know, to to not just donate, but how it really affects, you know, the these kids or just this the, the people that you meet overseas is because there are people out there who want to get involved they just don't know how um there are a lot of people who want to get involved who don't understand the 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 payout platform or they do understand that for most large um, foundations and they don't agree with it right because you see maybe sometimes 65 percent of it goes to administration right and it's like well uh even though you are doing it they are doing a good thing Unfortunately, it um, you don't want to pay for the paperwork. I you think, know, I, I think I our, our level, and I mean our level like individuals, uh, if someone says, hey, do you want to help? Everybody wants to help. And a lot of times you say, okay, here's $20, here's $50, here's $100. Um, where like you were mentioning, the big corporations, they have a lot of overhead. Uh, and your $50, $100, although everything helps, they're not gonna, you're not going to see an impact. You're going to see... With us, because we're non, we have no overhead. Um, your fifty dollars will help buy, uh, you know, uh, two shoes, two pairs of shoes in Argentina, um, and they'll help buy a, a week worth of groceries for somebody. And knowing that you give it to someone that goes there directly um, makes a difference. And on the other side, the people that travel that want to be part of this, um, it's very easy to do. It's a matter of just saying. Talk to, talk to us, say, hey, I'm going to this country. Uh, what do you think? And we'll be like, oh, the best idea is this. So we, we, we've probably been there. We, we've done it already. Um, but it's as simple as, as collecting funds from your friends. And with that money, so you're not alone and doing it. You collect, I don't know, $1,000. Who, who of your friends, if you say, hey, I'm going to, let's say that you went to, to, uh, to Tulum. And you say, who of your friends would not give you $50? to go buy groceries for children, you know? Uh, we all can do that. And right. sometimes people do it one time and that's it. Or sometimes like me, they do it one time. They're like, wow, this is amazing. It's so easy to do, I can do it. And, you know, when I went to Tulum, I only, it only took uh, half a day of, of my time there. Uh, you know, awesome. so it's very, very easy to do. That's awesome. And so all the information for your foundation will be um, listed in the caption, but also, or they can reach out to you and on your Instagram account, um, Amigos Near, which is what we're going to get into. Um, the, the, what you've done obviously is amazing, you know, to be able to show how easy it is to, to give and to put smiles on people's faces. Um, you have an Instagram account and it's very influential. It's very inspiring. Um, and this is your personal account, right? Well, no. So it's, it's the foundation account. So I okay. use it uh, as, a, as a foundation account. Um, so mo mostly, I, yeah, I don't have a personal account because I didn't know the time that you can switch. When I started this mm -hmm. a long, long time ago, I didn't want to have two different passwords. And so I just use the, uh, and a lot of the people that I follow are my friends anyways, and they know what, what we do. So I just kept, uh, kept the one. So I, I don't have a personal one. I only use the foundation one. Okay, so let's get into the, the nitty gritty of your content and stuff. Um, so you 
how, how do you strategize with what to post on your social media account? No strategy. No strategy. Okay, guys, so basically, you that. <laughs> so basically, uh, if you see, we don't post on a daily basis. I, I get annoyed myself when I see someone posting 15 stories in, in, uh, in one day. I'm He's like, talking about me, guys. <laughs> yes. I mean, not, not only you, but many people. And, it, and it's like, okay, a lot of times we don't have a lot of time. I mean, you, you go through, through stories and you just want to, you know, see if something interesting happens. So I post uh, on stories. I post very seldom. And I have two categories. As you all know, there's a personal button that uh, those are my personal friends. So, for example, Love, it's one of my personal friends on Instagram. So she's on the green button. So if I post something that is non-foundation uh, related, mm -hmm. but it's still to my friends, it's fine. So I'll, I'll post, a, I don't know, somewhere that I'm at having a drink. I'll just post that. And, but it'll go only to the green people, which are my personal. Now, if I post on the stories, I only, if it's on, for everybody, then I post something that is significant to the foundation. Um, so in the past, we have picture one of the photos or, um, or a video of but all related to the foundation. And then on the post is mostly uh, all related to the foundation. On the actual post, that's where you'll see that if we go to Argentina, we'll take photos and we'll post there. If, uh, for example, we upgrade uh, or every year we have to, with this uh, state of Florida, we have to file that we're still a corporation. We'll post that we are legit, you know, 501C, we'll post something like that. So those are how, but strategy wise to how to, make it better how to get more followers no no because i personally don't 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 really use it for that respect i want people to follow us that uh that know know through, of us through somebody else um and maybe that's where we need more help with uh, which love maybe will help us to become better at having more followers i don't know we only have like two thousand right now so that's a lot that's actually the most influential um, you can influence the most as a micro influencer, actually. So, because you have that close knit relationship and these are all your close friends and family, right? The majority, um, yes. The majority are, are, are people that I know or their friends, because every time we do a, for example, my friends that went to South Africa, the girls from Chicago. So it was five girls and they all went to South Africa doing Amigos Near. So they, they raised the funds in Chicago area, people that I don't know. Um, and then they went to South Africa and then when they came back, they posted all the photos with Amigos Near. So we got a bunch of following uh, of people that they're their friends, not my friends. So that's how sure. a little bit of our network has grown. Um, and people that they see that, they're like, oh, I want to do this. And then it'll be like, yeah, I'm friends with Carolina. I, I want to do that. I'm like, yeah, sure. Then you connect them. You know, it's a very, very personal sure. connection. And that's, and that's great because you know that the heart is ultimately there, you know, with, with all these people who are not just following you on Instagram, but just, just wanting to um, help because a lot of these people who want to help and who want to be a part of it can't at that moment. But if they, if you, if you share, you know, all the good work and all, what you're doing, um, it, it gets translated over time, you know, and that need or that, that the situation might be better for them. And so it's, it, I, that's why I love social media, um, you know, and the whole marketing aspect. And then, so are you, so you said you're not doing anything to grow, but right now you're at 2,200. Do you have, um, do you have goals set or just an idea set when you reach 5,000, 10,000, 1,000? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Absolutely not. Uh, I remember I posted, uh, when we first started doing Instagram, we would post 500, you know, 600, 700. But like I said, I, uh, I try to keep it very minimum on the postings. Um, so I, I don't, uh, well, yeah, I mean, if we make it to 3000, that'd be great. Or 5,000. Oh, 3,000 is easy. I can help you with yeah. 3,000. Right, well, <laughs> right. well, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 3000 is easy. I can help you. I can have the core reporter read back to you. <laughs> um, and then, so how do you feel you make an impact on social media? I know that when you travel, um, just to show those who are donating um, what you're actually doing with their money and with their hearts, um, you, you've taken pictures along the way. And now it's social media, right? But before, I'm sure you have books, you know, to show people um, as, you know, as time has gone. And so now we have social media to show people what 
what how their money is impacting the world like do you is that part of your platform where if you do travel to these places you must take pictures like right. how do you get so that, that content that's, that's exactly uh, right um before i used to i, I would have, and it is actually on me like i lack i used to send i used to have a email list that, that we would have all my contacts there and i would have an email and I would send an email saying, hey, we're doing this. Do you guys want to help? Um, you know, I would, it would be, if you guys want to donate, you know, I would send an email back, you know, that's how we mostly do it. Um, and then when I would come back from that trip, wherever it was, I would be like, this is what your money helped do. So then I would show them, but I would send it to the same people. So it would be a, a double, the people that donated will be like, hey, this is what you helped do. But then the people that didn't donate, it will be like, this is what this I didn't help you. That on. This is what yeah. I, I couldn't help this people. So it's uh, it was a way of keeping uh, my friends in the aviation uh, up to date on what we were doing whenever we did it. So we did that every year, um, but in, it just kind of drifted off, and I just haven't I haven't done it again. So now I'm more uh, specific. Um, I send out a couple of emails to specific people that I know that would like to help. And I'm like, hey, do you guys want to donate? And then I raise uh, a couple of thousand, but I don't do a massive uh, email anymore. Uh, I used to, and then we would get ten dollars from ten dollars to a thousand dollars donations. Uh, but now I, I just I, I do it more specific. But that's on me. That's that's part of what I haven't been able to continue to do, uh, sure. which is to keep up with. Because uh, again, it's not a job, right? So right. if it was my job, it would be a priority, but it's not, I have other, I have a priority, which is, uh, so yeah, that's one of the things that I, I used to do, which I don't do anymore. That's great. And then, so you have had, um, so not just on social media, but you've been on other publications. Do you mend the two like somehow as either yeah, so content or? We were, um, at one time, uh, a friend of mine uh, was going to go uh, on CNN in Espanol. And mm -hmm. the, she, she knows the story. She's like, yeah, let's, let's bring them on. I'm like, sure. No problem. Just like I said, yes to you. You know, I have no problem talking to people. Uh, and um, so, yeah, we went to CNN Espanol. Uh, that was uh, eight years ago. We were just starting. Um, it was, uh, we had been in Haiti a few times already. Um, so we, we, they, they feature us there on, and, and they're in their program. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. And then we are on, um, on Brickle Magazine, we I live in Brickle, which is an area here in, in downtown Miami. Um, they feature us a few times about the foundation in Brickle Magazine as well. How do you think that you can improve on um, on your social media? Well, I think uh, the hashtags and the you know I, I I don't I'm again I'm guilty of that as well of not using the hashtags, of not tagging other people. Uh, you know, I just, I just post a photo of what we did and here, if someone wants to see it, someone, you know, it's, it's, up, to, it's up to them. Uh, I know there's ways to improve it, which I know you're very well versed on, uh, on how to make it better. I just don't know or have the time to really, you know, to do, really do it. I do it, like I said, I myself, if I see someone posting all the time, I'm like, I'm well. Or you know, uh, uh, mute the stories, or you know, um, because sometimes you just don't want to be following someone that's all the time posting, 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 posting. So don't sure. do unto don't do unto others as you don't want done to you. Um, I try to keep it very very limited, um, and also that kind of makes it special, right? So if you don't if you're not posting all the time, you post one time, people are, will pay attention and 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 be like, oh, this just happened. So, for example, okay. I haven't posted uh, the pictures from Mexico. Um, we, we, I just posted the photos from Argentina. So, um, you know, I just haven't had a moment, but I'll post those eventually. So, that's great. Okay, for those out there who are wanting to do something like you, um, where they can reach out to the whether it's for their personal brand or professional brand, what suggestion or what advice would you give them as far as you know, making an impact with their, with whatever it is that they're doing on social media. So I would say that the most important thing is to listen to you, but apparently you know the answers. 
So, you know, I would say that's a, that's a pretty easy one. <laughs> Obviously, I'm just saying that I can't do this, that I'm not really good at it. So I wouldn't uh, dare to give any advice. The only advice would be to listen to love and have her teach you how to do it. That would be that this would be. This is my... a great ad. <laughs> how much do I owe you <laughs> for this? Well, thank you so much for being on this show and sharing um, to the world about your foundation as well as what you do and how you you also make an impact in the aviation industry. And with little or no effort, you're making a huge impact. Impact not just influencing people to to um, to share and to give little of what they have to those who are in need, but also inspiring people that it just takes just the heart, you know, to, to, to help people. So thank you yeah, so much. There, for there's one quote that uh, we love to repeat that uh, not everybody can do great things, uh, but everybody can do great things with love. That's the thing. That's the, uh, the quote. I agree. That, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, now they, I, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure Mother Teresa didn't mean you personally, but she would have, if she would have met you, like, yes, I think love should be involved in every little thing that we do. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Ciao.